Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for February the 11th, 2022. This is episode number 97. On today's show, we'll be talking about Hyundai Ioniq 5 winter range and charging test and the debut of the 2023 Kia Sportage FEV plug-in hybrid. So I'm Dominic Dioni, Inside EVs forum moderator and Inside EVs editor. Joining us today is the estimable Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. Uh, we also have the multi-talented Mr. Martin Lee from the recently revamped EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial hotel regency house in Chicago. Uh, where he's there on behalf of uh, Out of Spec Studios, and he also puts together Cars Gone Wild videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. All right, so before we get going, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to the channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that elk bell icon for notifications. If you're watching us on Twitch, you can also ring that bell icon for notifications. All right, so with that out of the way, welcome everybody. So let's kick it off with our Comet of the Week, or Katwa for short. Um, so our comment of the week comes from Friday's show when we had uh, Anthony C chimed in with 25 minutes before Kyle spoke. Who had 25 in the betting pool? So uh, basically, I think we uh, we had skipped over Kyle. And we left him out of the conversation for like 25 minutes. And it, That's okay. And I was listening. enjoying listening. It was great. I didn't even realize it. We we're hogged the mic, and he was sitting there, you know, patiently, just you know, biding his time. So, so we're going to make up for that uh, for that slight this week, and so we're, let's kick this off with Kyle talking about <laughs> his snowy adventures in the Tesla Model Three. Uh, it's it's uh, booted up with Nokian Hakapolita Ten studded EV winter tires. So the Auto Spec Reviews channel has a great video showing how they basically turned his Tesla Model 3 performance into a snowmobile. Uh, it was awesome, and you had snow everywhere. So tell us about it a bit, Kyle. Are these the best snow tires ever? How did we select this story to talk about at the beginning of the show? Because this it was is, all okay. awesome, man. It's like yeah, great. it was look cool. I had no idea. Um, you know, for those who know, I, we don't look at the sh I don't look at the show notes before we start, so this is always a surprise when we <laughs> when I log in. Uh, this so. Uh, those of you who know, I, I own a Tesla Model 3 Performance. I've owned this car for two and a half years. It's the longest I've ever actually owned a car for. And that's mostly because there hasn't been any major updates to the Model 3 chassis. If they said, we're coming out with an electric hatchback Model 3 and it'll do whatever, I would do it. It's just there hasn't really been a reason to sell this car. It's been so good for us. And um, we... Uh, teamed up with uh, Nokian last year. They sponsored some of our content. We we filmed a lot of things and they gave us this set of Nokian studded tires. And, you know, I thought that was pretty cool, but we actually kind of needed them this winter. So we threw them on because we've been having really icy roads recently. And so we, we slapped these things on and like the most ultimate aggressive snow tire combination, an EV specific studded winter tire paired with a very narrow 18 inch Martian wheel. For those who don't know Martian wheels, my, my friend Drew owns Martian wheels. We all know Drew. Um, and uh, he, he made these very good snow wheels, very narrow. And yeah, we threw these things on. And I got to tell you, this car is completely unstoppable. We were in snow up to the hood and it was just plowing through stuff that we couldn't even film because it was too deep for us. We were, we're not even touching pavement. So we're just on top of snow skating on the battery pack and it's just chugging through totally magical really is quite a, a seriously aggressive uh, bit of kit. And what's interesting about driving an EV in this much snow is you hear nothing, right? Because <laughs> there's no tire noise because you're not touching pavement. And so you're just driving in silence. It's like you're in this weird VR dream world. It's very cool. Right on. Um, so are those the best snow tires that you think you've ever had? So they're definitely the most aggressive snow tires I've personally ever owned. They're not as aggressive as like a studded ice racing tire that wouldn't be street legal. These right. are still street legal. Nokian's uh, studded technology is, is really good. The studs stay in the tires. I can't recommend them for most people because a studded tire is seriously aggressive. And again, studs don't help in snow. They help on ice. That's right. um, but 
what's interesting is coming this year uh, for next winter, which is probably when most people make will be making their next purchase, Nokian is having a non-studded version, basically, of, of these very aggressive tires. And that's going to be good for most people. However, in places where you get a lot of ice and you're constantly driving on snow, I, the studs are fine. There's very little downside. We've driven on warm days on you know hard pavement and it's it is a bit noisier at low speed but at high speed you really don't notice it also i think you mentioned the uh the performance of, of the tesla model 3 in that video as well it just has like a, the right amount of slip it has really good you know wheel control i don't know if you want to mention that at all yeah so i i tend to drive in the uh program slip start profile in the tesla to just allow some more rotation because you do want some some higher wheel rotation than vehicle rotation or vehicle speed in uh deep snow and really uh, a magical drivetrain tuning on on any electric car but particularly tesla just gets it so right they do such a great job with this and um maybe a little bit of up, an update on this car coming up uh, in a in a few days maybe next week i'm going to start filming the big hundred thousand mile uh overview anyway the car actually broke down on us uh last oh. week and the parking brake got locked on in the middle of nebraska and i had to go out with the sprinter and bring a trailer and it was just a disaster so we finally decided to fix this parking brake issue and it was just a sensor that needed to be plugged in now the car's fine awesome Man. yeah it's amazing <laughs> 103,000 miles of pure abuse we have not shown this car any mercy and it right. is fine Right. So Kyle, the sensor got unplugged somehow. Like it just... was probably our fault when we changed the brakes. Mine uh -huh. mostly. I probably didn't push it back in all the way. <laughs> but I think what was happening was it was loose. So we had this very intermittent, uh, you know, warning whenever we had hit like rumble strips in the road or a bump, it would pop up and kill autopilot and say your parking brake's not going to work. And it always uh, performed fine. It just showed the warnings. And I'm like, oh, I'll get to that at some point. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Alyssa was driving it in Nebraska. And she said, I don't know how, how this really happened. But she said that the um, car just locked the parking brake on her randomly while she was driving. And I'm like, well, that's pretty sketchy. So she got it on the side of the road. It's, it'll be on out of spec motoring. But there's like sheriffs looking under the car trying to help her plug this thing in. And yeah, everyone was doing their best to help. But she ended up driving on on it to get to a safer spot um, with the parking brake locked on. I think warped the rear rotor. But again, the, the car it was just a sensor. Right on. Hey, all right. So uh, you, Kyle, you also had a couple a couple of charging videos featured featuring the uh, Hyundai Ionic Five this week. So one of those was a test to see if you could replicate the results that you'd seen some from European owners who say charging power rates were very low, like around thirty kilowatts or something. So tell us about that video how you set up the test and, and what happened maybe what conclusions you came to well the best part about having the ionic 5 this week was actually tom also had the ionic 5 right. this week so we were able to do a, and we'll, i'm sure we'll talk about that this show we were able to do a ton of comparing and contrasting in sort of real time on the phone of what are you seeing what are we seeing and and sort of talking about our testing procedures this particular video was designed to set up sort of a worst case cold soak situation um it wasn't unbelievably cold it did get down to i believe seven degrees fahrenheit which is very cold but by the time we shot this test it warmed up pretty quick and it was still under freezing but it was in the 20s and what we did was we left the car outside overnight my friend zach left it at his house we booted it up in winter mode drove it to a dc fast charger so winter mode should in theory heat up the battery a little bit the idea was you live in an urban environment that only has DC fast charging. You leave the car outside overnight. It's time to charge in the morning. What are you going to get by the time you get to the charger? And we got over 60 kilowatts on plug-in, which is okay. very impressive. Now, I do believe we have a different battery pack than the European spec cars. Ours is a 77.4 kilowatt hour. I think theirs is a couple different, but now you guys are getting them. Is that true, Martin? It's one module short. The The first cars, uh, it's uh, one module less than the EV6, uh, but we get them for the 2023 model year, which if you order the car now, it's a December delivery, so that's the car you're going to get. So if you make a new, there's had problems ordering the four-wheel drive version, the all-wheel drive version of the Onyx 5 in the UK as well, but I think you can order that now. I think if you order one now, you get it at the end of the year, maybe slipping into the beginning of next year, and you get the full-size battery pack. Um, and while you're talking, did you guys, I should have mentioned this before we went live, get the press release from Hyundai yesterday? Or was that a UK press release about the digital door mirrors and things? 
saw that, but not not in the U.S. because any nothing applied in that press release to our market. Uh, right. right. So yeah, seventy-seven point four kilowatt hour battery pack, digital door mirrors. It says an option and uh, smart frequency dampers to improve the ride. And what was the other thing? The rear view um, mirror camera. Rear view oh yeah, mirrors. digital rear view camera. It's That's going under because there's no wiper on the back. That's right. Uh, they're putting it under the top spoiler. It's still going to get pretty dirty, if you ask me. Um, but Maybe they'll have the washer fluid. They like need the some washer does. on that, yeah. They need something on it, because it does get pretty dirty back there. And also, they are adding uh, battery conditioning to the UK models as well, which is That's different right. to winter mode. Um, but I think if you spec the Eco Pack, then you get the heat pump. Uh, though really, that should have been on all the cars, but don't get me started. Um, then it's not just this kind of winter mode, but it's a proper battery conditioning that if you navigate... Within the car's nav, if you navigate to a DC fast charger, whether it needs to heat up the pack or cool down the pack, it will do that. But that is from the 2023 model year. Um, no news on whether they're adding back in the driver Can assistance. Can we just talk stuff. about how Hyundai released this incredible car with the best drivetrain architecture and everything is so far advanced, but they didn't think about warming it up before getting to a charger? Well, I don't understand how that wasn't part of the original spec of the car. And I, I think it is just if you have the heat pump. And again, it, European spec, UK spec, US spec all changes slightly. Even the names of the specs are different, which is frustrating to compare you know, apples to apples. But if you do have the heat pump, I think you can get it. And I don't know why this can't be an over-the-air update. If you have the heat pump, every Ionic 5 owner now, and they've been out a year over here, should be getting this feature if you ask me it shouldn't be a return to dealer or it shouldn't be a paid upgrade it should be we're sorry we messed up in the first place it's coming over the air I, I, does the arnic 5 even have over the air updates yet not that we've seen deployed not that in i've seen world. so it's frustrating for those early owners at least the new cars will have it but yeah anyway the back back to your back to your review i think uh, martin one sec uh, you're you're a little out of, either you're a little out of focus or i'm still drunk i'm not really sure but <laughs> sorry about that yeah. probably, focusing <laughs> the, probably focusing on the microphone there other than me which is no bad thing <laughs> the, the mic was perfect <laughs> yeah, okay. if, if you want to see this it's absolutely yeah. perfect but yeah. right <laughs> you know, and i i did some charging on mine i had as kyle mentioned i had an ionic five limited uh, for, for a week. I did the range test. That video is up on, on Inside EVs. We're going to talk about that a little later. Yeah. Uh, but I also charged it a lot. I charged it um, two times. I charged it from 10 to 80 percent, uh, one on a 150 kilowatt charger, one on a 350, just to see if there's any difference. And then the, the last time after I finished the range test, I charged it from zero to 100. So oh. I have three solid recordings of, 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 of it in New Jersey where it was a little bit colder, well, not colder than Kyle saying he charged it once in the 20s. Um, and the both times I did 10 to 80%, it, it finished within 10 seconds of, of each recording. It was like perfect. And it was exactly 30 minutes from 10 to 80%, which Hyundai, uh, you know, says it's, it's 18 minutes, but that's uh, obviously in, in better conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, the vehicle I had was a limited, so it had the heat pump. I had battery warming on. I drove it really hard to the to the um, charging station, and I actually dr drove it down to two percent state of charge. Put it on DC fast charger, charged it up to like fifteen or sixteen percent, then got back in it and drove it hard down to ten percent to try to give it a little bit of a boost to warm it up some. And it still, uh, you know, I didn't see anything near the 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 power that um, it should be taking in. I think I maxed out at like one sixty kilowatt somewhere like that. But like Kyle, every time I plugged in, um, I didn't, even the times I didn't try to pre-warm it, I pulled just about 70 kilowatts, 68, 67 immediately. I didn't see any of that 30 kilowatt that we saw in, you know, some of the European charge recordings. So, um, but I, to be honest with you, I, I don't know how effective the winter mode is with the battery warming. I think it just really keeps the battery from getting critically cold. I don't think it it, it it works nearly as well as, say, the Taycan or the Lucid Air or Tesla vehicles where it's really preconditioning the battery for DC fast charging, trying to get it up to that optimal temperature so that you can really pull, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of power. I don't think currently it's set up to do that. I think it's just set up so that if it's really cold, like the battery won't get like, you know, zero degrees Celsius, you know, so... 
Um, they, they need to do some work on that. And Kyle's 100% right that it's it's surprising. They, they did so many things right. And they really dropped the ball on on battery, you know, battery management with uh, temperature wise. So on on your test, Kyle, um, did you do it from zero to one hundred in the cold like that? Yep, and yeah, saw saw really good speeds. But we probably drove it harder than you, Tom, would be my guess because uh, we were probably getting a few. I don't know. We ripped on this thing to warm it up because we just had to get it hot. So we were like, you know, wide open throttle, big regen plug it in 240 kilowatts but you know we just had the space to do that where we are whoa, whoa. Uh, yeah i didn't have the space but i did I, I let me tell you i was getting looks and people were blowing the horn at me you know i'm not afraid to do that As i was going down 280 route 287 <laughs> to the charging station full throttle till about 80 90 90 miles an hour full regen down to 50 miles an hour full throttle up to 90 miles an hour as I'm going down the road and people around me are like giving me the finger and everything. And I'm like smiling and waving. So <laughs> Kyle, I, I, you know, you know, I know how to do that and you know, I'm not afraid to do it, but I didn't do it probably as long as you did. I only did it for about 10 or 15 minutes on the way to the charging station from my house. Yeah. So, we gave it a you know, full hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's what it needs. You know. Yeah, and and yeah, it's just, well. Actually, it's a good thing that it doesn't really heat up with hard driving that quickly because it shows that there's not much resistance in the internal drivetrain and battery pack, and you really yeah. shouldn't have heat loss. But right. um, you know, the, the, I'm sure as the cars age and they have more DC charging, they'll build up more resistance and they'll heat up quicker. Um, but um, basically, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's hard to really heat these things up properly. Anyway, what, what I found was I, I put up a whole half hour long video explaining all of my charging sessions from A to Z, all of the variabilities, everything I believe as to why uh, we're seeing these uh, interesting things on our deep charging tests when we analyze curves. I have one curve, I have two different charging tests I've done with this cars, uh, these cars in two different locations. Um, and basically it's a really strong start with a taper and then the other one's a pretty slow start and it tapers up. And so completely opposites. And I explained why I think that's the case. And it's all in a, a 30 minute video on out of spec reviews. And I, I could probably talk about it for two hours, but we, we don't need to bore everyone with that. There's already content on YouTube about it. So you had, so you did two videos and that was the second one as well that you did with the two sessions. Correct. So the second video that went up after the cold gating video is probably if you're interested in how the car charges, all of my findings, everything that I've I've heard and seen and, and experienced with the car, and um, sort sort of you know posing some questions as well. It's sort of the state of charging on Ionic Five right now, if you will, uh, based off of my experience. But and you also mentioned in your your first video that you had it, it had been updated. You had the you you had the software update number there. I don't know. If, yeah, do you know so if you and Tom are in the same software? Well, this is interesting because Hyundai claims that that software doesn't affect the uh, drivetrain of the car. It was just a oh. uh, user interface update. Uh, it's very possible, but I think we have sufficient evidence to say that perhaps there is a software update on the cars and we might not be looking at the right software in the system. There might be another level that does drivetrain because on every version, uh, you know, Kia EV6, which has the same battery pack and Hyundai Ionic 5 a couple times, I have DC charged these cars on multiple sessions in different continents. And every time at around 82 or 83% state of charge, it dips to basically zero. The charger will supply the load on the car. So your heat, your cooling pumps, your air conditioning pumps, and then it holds there for like 160 to 300 seconds and then comes back up. And what it's doing at these states of charge is doing a battery check. The Hyundai Ionic 5, we're right in that state of charge right now. You'll see actually this might be my first recording uh earlier on you'll see this one dip down i believe yeah we're towards the end of the video this is what it does it goes down to seven all the the chargers just supplying the car the base load of what the car needs and it does this as a battery check what what i asked the engineers about it they're looking at all of the different modules making sure the voltages are the same before they top charge the car um zach's car after many long and warm dc fast charging sessions just like this uh, did, did not exhibit that behavior. And I think that's proof enough that there must be a different software on the car. And and 32 gigabyte software update is true. It is a 32 gigabyte software update that we installed to this Ionic 5. Um, but, but actually other Hyundai owners, non-electric, like a Sonata owner commented that they also had a 32 gigabyte software update for their user interface. So it couldn't be drivetrain related if they're telling the truth. 
Wow, that's kind of crazy. That's a lot of <laughs> that's a lot of gigabytes. Kyle, I haven't watched your video yet. How long did it take to before it shut off? Zero to one hundred. Do you remember? Yeah, both both were around forty minutes or so. Zero to one hundred. Okay, and mine mine was fifty five. Yeah, the, nothing was touching fifty. Yeah, so, there were so, over forty both of them, but I think it was like thirty eight minutes to ninety five percent in one of them, something like that. So well, since I did mine after the seventy mile an hour highway range test. I couldn't have battery warming on winter mode on during the range test or it would have cut into the range. So, you know, I rolled in, you know, on Cold. a driving a constant 70 miles an hour, which doesn't strain the battery at all, you know, and on a cold day. So I wasn't expecting, you know, really to set any records. And right. uh, it's good that, you know, what I like about it is that what we, Kyle and I have, you know, between the two of us, maybe six or seven recordings now on the Hyundai Ionic 5, and they're all under different conditions doing different things like i didn't i tried to warm the battery up but i didn't do it for an hour and a half like kyle did you know so uh, you know we have different representations of different situations in different temperatures which the more data the better you know no no there is no one charging curve on any electric vehicle you know it's the people drive them in different temperatures all different states of charge plugging in so it's good that you know between all these recordings that we put out there people can the more you watch the more of a the big picture you'll get of Ionic 5 charging, which is, um, you know, I think part of what's so good about when Kyle and I do things, the same thing, you know, it's not just like, oh, well, I watched Tom's video. I don't need to watch Kyle's video. That's not true. Same with the range well, test, same with the video. charging. Put you to sleep. Watch as many as you can, because you'll always, you know, um, pick up something different in each one of our recordings. Right. When we boil it down to it, if you own an Ionic 5, plug it into the charger and don't worry about it but if you're nerds like us you will worry about it and right. this is what i dig into hyundai was so confused when i kept asking them all these questions so like what what it did the car charge i'm like yes but it didn't like charge the way that i thought and they were like what what, what are you talking about <laughs> well talk about hyundai being confused so um you know the the and i don't mean to be a beat up hyundai session i love the ionic 5 i tell you after the week honestly i really want to buy one and i actually talked to kyle about this like I like want to sell my model three and get one but we're not for that right now um so um so the the when i was doing the inside evs 70 mile an hour high range test one of the things we like to do is talk about the epa rated range we like to talk about um the the highway epa rated range the epa stopped listing city and highway epa range ratings for some of the vehicles they just give you the combined and while you know we'll use that as a measuring stick it's not that fair when we do highway range tests we should talk about highway range ratings but in any event the ionic 5 has a, a, a 19 inch wheel and tire combo and a 20 inch wheel and tire combo but they're both rated at the same range on the epa site and that's goes against what we've all really come to realize with electric cars wheel and tire combinations make a big difference right and a lot of times the oems will test different um uh you know did that both all their wheel combinations and say look like tesla's famous for that way if you put the the 22 inch wheels on it goes 340 miles if you have the 19 inch it goes 400 miles so you know it, it makes a big difference but for some reason the uh, the ionic 5 has the same range rating with both power and wheel combinations so i reached out to hyundai to um to uh uh find out you know did you just because what hyundai could do is test the one that's least efficient and then just say that's the range for the all the cars you know, for the that's iron what porsche does yeah they can't list the most efficient one you know and then say that um so the the, the crazy thing is and I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, um look up the exact because i don't know what the, the answer i got from Hyundai was classic like i don't even understand what they're saying um right. I'm going to, I'm going to pull that up in a little bit after we talk a little bit, I'm going to pull my email. It just came out of, uh, it just hit me right now, but I got the answer yesterday and I don't even know how to like incorporate this into my articles. Wait till I pull the comment. Well, here's the thing. It's, it, it is very difficult, right? We're, we, most journalists, which are what the automakers are equipped to handle are, you know, high level vehicle evaluations. How many USB ports does it drive nice? What's the zero to 60? What's the competition? What's the price? we're getting into you know in the combustion side it's hey my 1.6 liter supercharger actually overheats after 17 pulls at 5400 feet of elevation and like any 
automaker would be like, what? We're talking like, hey, my car is normally pulling 300 amps at 27% state of charge, but I'm only seeing 274. They are not equipped to handle this level of detail. And right. you know, some automakers are Ford, really good, Porsche, really good, because they uh, know and they're prepared for our level of deep coverage. A lot of these automakers launching cars, I, I'm actually helping them learn about their vehicles um, so that they are better prepared to handle questions from journalists that might be digging in more. What it really boils down to is, you know, my, my whole thing is this all of our deep level testing, range testing, charging testing doesn't actually really matter in my opinion for most people because the car goes far enough on a charge and it charges fast enough for pretty much anyone, even if it is cold. 67 kilowatts is livable. Just plug it in and walk away. I'm knocking things over. <laughs> but it really does, uh, you know, when we do our testing, we're on our own. It's very hard to get support from engineers uh, and other people to, to really help us here. And so we just have yeah. to report on what we find and set up the conditions that we think are, are um, you know, ideal for the car to perform its best when we do our testing. And and look, we're living in the real world. I have to say, Ionic 5 is awesome, really good car. Uh, it's very, you know, basically what it's doing is it's, a, it's an algorithm that changes its charging curve based off of temperature in real time. It's not like Mustang Mach-E that has these set ledges. It's not like ID4 that has kind of a flat curve. It's not like Big E Trunk that can just sit at 150 pretty much nonstop unless it's a frozen ice brick. It it just changes, and that's okay for us to live with. And, and every charging session will be a little bit different. So so I found the email. Let me let me go back to this now. So I sent them a long email explaining the two wheel sizes. Some OEMs will certify each size and so forth and so on. I I was as you know. At, at, I explained it as much as I could because I know that there was going to be a question. So the first answer came back. OK, let me get the best way to explain this to you. I'll get back to you. And now this this is I'm not going to name names, but this is a senior, you know, uh, service and technology manager and public relations. So here's the final answer. Tom, it's a harmonic average based on the anticipated sales volumes of the two trim levels. Oh, well, OK. So <laughs> basically what they did was they took. The big wheels and the small wheels averaged the figures and said 98% of the cars are going to be SEL. So it's yeah, right. a primarily weighted factor of the smaller wheels, which I've never <laughs> yes. seen done before. I've yeah, that's an interesting seen, approach. It, it, yeah, <laughs> and that's exactly, Tom, that's exactly what I answered. Hmm, very interesting approach. <laughs> Thanks for the information. Like, I've never heard anybody, you know, that's how they base that, that, that average. So it's... Well, it makes sense why there's so many base cars coming to the U.S. then, uh, because it's so everyone wants. Here's the thing. Hyundai approached this launch that Hyundai buyers were going to buy the Ionic 5. So they did, you know, 80 percent. I don't know the numbers. The bulk of cars are the mid spec, which I don't think is packaged very well for our market. It's missing glass roof. It should at least have that. Um, ID4 has it in mid spec and it's way cheaper. So that to me is just a miss on their part. Um Mid spec is the bulk of the cars. Base spec is like the second. And then your top limited trim is the one that they projected no one would want. And I think in the real world, we're seeing the exact opposite. People are settling for lower trim cars because they can't get top trim limiteds. And I think the EV buyer, especially an early adopter of this level of EV technology, is not your traditional Hyundai buyer. And they want all the stuff. They're the nerds. Give us right. everything. We want the reclining seat. We want the good sound system got the good wheels and um i i think they messed up in their 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 packaging and ordering uh levels for the u.s in my opinion interesting hey hey uh tom before we move on from the charging part i just wanted to say that so your your test you you run that after doing your zero zero to uh your 70 mile an hour range test and so it was very i think uh reflective of i think of what most people will see in the real world in the winter time and at the temperatures that you ran it at mm -hmm. um so i just wanted if you could just give us a really quick breakdown of the temperature and then the times is zero to 100 but really the time from 20 to 80 is really the, the key thing just to reiterate that yeah so um the temperature when i started the range test was about 20 degrees fahrenheit uh, when I finished it, it had gotten up to, I think, 38, 37, 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is okay. you know, a little above uh, zero, a couple degrees Celsius, I guess. So that's when I plugged in. And, um, you know, I plugged in. It was in the mid to high 30s, and it pretty much stayed in that uh, temperature for the whole charging session. 
and it actually charged a little bit quick. Uh, I was really focusing on 10 to 80 Dom, not 20 to 80. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the two times earlier, I just did a 10 to 80, not zero to 100. It took exactly 30 minutes, both times on a, on 150 kilowatt and a 350 kilowatt station. Now this was on a 350 kilowatt station plugged in at zero. Uh, and it took 33 minutes to get to 80%. But if you, and I think it was six minutes, it was six minutes to get to 10%. So if you subtracted the the time it took to 10, the 10 to 80 was um, uh, 27 minutes, three minutes quicker than when I just did the uh, the 10 to the, the 10 to 80s. Okay, that's not so, so far outside of the, the, what do they quote? Is it 10 to 80 that they quote in 18 minutes? Yeah, 10 to 80, 18 minutes. So listen, okay. it's still even in, a, if you want to call it poor charging for the Ionic 5, it's still pretty good. You oh, know, yeah. and it That's still great. is not That's a the moral of the story. Yeah, it's it's still like it's still charged to a hundred percent, and nobody should be charging to a hundred percent. We've gone over this many times. Right. For me, it's still charged to a hundred percent in under an hour, like 53 minutes. Kyle was under 50 minutes. So you know, the even in its like say porous charging conditions, 10 to 80 in a half an hour, that's pretty good. You know, that's that that's that's not bad compared to other electric vehicles. And this was in its worst charging form. So it's only going to get better than that right. as yep. the temperature warms up. And we'll hey, probably Dominic. do this again in the summertime, right? Uh, well, yeah, oh, yeah. We'll... I'm, I'm going to request one. You know, I'm sure Kyle and I will both ask for a vehicle when it's warm. We'll do warm range tests because we did cold weather range tests and warm charging. Uh, we have tests. one now because one of the guys who works for us uh, it owns it. So cool. we'll be doing all, yeah. the, all the stuff. Um, can we talk about something I don't think I even told any of you guys about up to this point, but I just wanted to mention it because Ford is so awesome. They let me ride in their F100 electric pickup truck yesterday. Oh, the Illuminator. Awesome. The Illuminator. Yeah, I got to go for a rip in it. We did a huge burnout. It was awesome. Uh, really you on, cool. You have that on video? Yeah, it's it's on out of spec reviews this morning. So that was, oh, okay. uh, yeah, it just, just went up and um, yeah, actually went up during the podcast. Uh, awesome. Maybe, Maybe Martin can line that up real quick while uh, while I mention that. So uh, we did. We've been doing a couple of uh, midweek bonus shows. So if you haven't seen them yet, uh, last Monday we did. We sat down with uh, Brian Gu from Xpeng Motors. He's the president and, and vice chairman of, of the uh, Chinese automaker, and it was a great. Uh, we, it was a great auto interview. Uh, they don't sell their cars here yet. But they do in Europe, and they're expanding. They're, they just ex just announced some expansion in, in Europe as well, and so, so that's a great. If you haven't seen that yet, definitely check that out. And then yesterday we we spoke with uh, Ford, um, Ryan from Ford. His last name. O'Gorman. O'Gorman, that's right. And uh, he was telling us about the Ford Intelligent Backup Power uh, System for the F one hundred and fifty Lightning. So if you have any questions on that, we we give him all these questions. That well, you know everything that. Uh, Tom's listeners or viewers uh, had asked about over after several videos covering that. So that I, I, I thought really, uh, really hit a lot of all the top points for that uh, feature. And so if you have any interest in empowering your home from your truck, definitely check that out. And uh, actually, Tom, and Tom, next week we have something else. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've been doing more and more of these midweek shows. The listeners and uh, viewers seem to want them. So uh, we're going to start. I mentioned a month or so ago that we were going to, we were interested in doing an infrastructure series. And we got a lot of comments from people saying, yeah, do that. That would be awesome. So we've been setting this up now and we're going to have one show a week for the next four or five weeks. We're going to do them. We're going to try to do them on Monday uh, mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern live. So you guys can ask us questions. We might, some of them might be on Tuesdays, but so far we're, set, we're setting this stage for Mondays at 10 and we already have the first one scheduled next week, and it is with Electrify America. They're sending on uh, Rob Barasa, who's the Senior Director of Business, Business Development and Marketing for Electrify America. So this isn't some low-level guy. He's way up at the top of the company, and we're going to be asking him about you know, Electrify America, their current state, their future, where they're going, where they see the industry going. Uh, we're going to ask questions ourselves. We're also going to pull questions from uh, the viewers. So make sure you tune in this Monday, 10 a.m. And uh, we're going to uh, have a nice chat with uh, Rob and uh, talk Electrify America and uh, infrastructure. And we, we also have a few other networks coming up too, right? 
Yeah, we have uh, ChargePoint is is on board. It looks like EVGO, although um, we haven't gotten the official. Yeah, we're definitely coming, but yeah, we want to do this. I, I've already gotten. So looks like we're going to do Electrify America, ChargePoint, EVGO for sure. Uh, and then we're going to have some uh, another show with uh, representatives from utilities, the people that work with uh, in within um, the electric vehicle infrastructure. De, uh, departments in public utilities. We'll talk about the challenges utilities have with adding these massive, you know, charging stations that require so much power. And this is a, these are, this is really a unique um, industry for, or challenge for the utilities because, you know, some of these charging station sites command as much power as like a small town. So, you know, it's, you know, you, you they wouldn't expect to just add a town here and there in the middle of where there's already town. So it, it's a challenge. And we also have, uh, we're going to have somebody from Europe come on right. and talk about, uh, you know, the state of infrastructure in Europe. So this is going to be four or five weeks in a row and uh, live. So you'll be able to ask your questions. Right on. All right. So let's, uh, Martin, do you have that Illuminator video back up? Sorry. There we go. So this is, Kyle, this is like what a custom, is this the Mach-E drivetrain in the? Yeah, so the, the, the point of this truck is is not that Ford is making an F100. They could never, it doesn't pass crash anymore. Like this is, right. you know, old school. The point of, of this video and, and this, uh, this vehicle is to showcase uh, a crate motor that you can purchase from Ford or their distributors that essentially is a powertrain. And the nice thing about buying an electric motor new from a trusted supplier such as Ford in my opinion, is that it's just going to work. It's reliable, right? They put this in a production car. It's no different than a rear-wheel drive Mach-E. We haven't really heard of these things breaking down. It's a solid piece of motor. And um, it's, the, it's the small rear motor, so it's just under 300 horsepower, just over 300 pound-feet of torque. Um, pretty spicy for old cars. It's going to be more than, than what you get. And you get all that torque at zero, which is great. Um, and you can configure it any way you want. They don't sell you the inverter, the controller, the battery pack. It's just the motor. So they built this vehicle to highlight that particular piece. And it's an entire Mach-E basically in a pickup truck. It has the same 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, 88 usable. It has the same charging port on the side. It looks so well integrated. It has a Mach-E interior with Mach-E seats that function and the big screen. Everything's fully integrated. Everything fully works. I don't even think the system knows it's in a pickup truck. I think it thinks it's in a Mach-E, but um, it's awesome. It was cool. And we just took it around a little bit. Now, other outlets bigger than than out of spec, of course, are, are taking it out and doing bigger stories. I hope we could do that one day. And um, I thought one that was really interesting was Haggerty took it to a full track day and ripped it around the racetrack. And I just absolutely loved that they did that. So, you know, I, the chances of us getting to play around with this again are slim, although I would love to. I think it's a great idea that Ford is making this electric motor. And it's right up my alley because I am thinking about sort of a new daily car for myself. And I've been going from everything from the new Golf R to, you know, a, a classic something. And I would really love to an ele to electrify a classic Range Rover. You get rid of all the, the engines that yeah. suck and put in an electric drivetrain. And I'm a Range Rover nerd, so... This would be a very interesting motor to put in there. So, you know that that's the idea of these projects. Right on. Hey, is that is that motor is that between the back wheels or is that up in front somehow? Was it was it a traditional drive shaft? Yeah, and and they had an outside company do all the work. So I don't know how familiar Mark was with all of everything, but essentially okay. my understanding is the motor's up front, runs a drive shaft to the back yeah. without question. Um, I think they probably could have found a way to mount it on the rear, but if you already have the drive line and the drive shaft right. and it's rated for the power, why not just mount it up front? Um, and th that's totally fine. You're not going for max efficiency with these things. Right. I have, a, if I electrify, I have like a, an old range Ford Ranger in my, in my garage. And if I electrified that, I would want to keep the original drive train, you know, the standard, yep. uh, it's a standard shift four wheel drive. So I keep my four wheel drive, all, all that. You know, I just leave it in like third gear all the time or something. Yeah, yeah, and I can use that'll let me use a smaller electric motor too, which is more affordable. Yep. Yeah, and it has well, a I think this motor is like four grand. It wasn't too bad oh, for that's a not, real. That's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah, for a, like a, a a legit Ford brand new electric motor. Don't quote me on the price. I don't. I I just think it's around there is what Jordan told me. Right. How many kilowatts did you say? Um. Uh, so someone commented 210 kilowatts. I, they, they didn't know the kilowatt number when I was there with the okay. vehicle. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad for that price. Perfect. Slap two of these bad boys on there. Eight grand. You got a, a 420 kilowatt 
output thing, that's awesome. You got to buy the batteries though. Yeah. That's the expensive part. Right. Salvage Tesla batteries or something. A lot of used laptop batteries and tape them together. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, if, if, it worked, uh, if it worked for the original Roadster, I'm sure it'll work for your uh, your Range Rover. Right. Uh, that'd be a great uh, YouTube series. I'd watch every one. If you did like a YouTube series over 20, 30 parts of, of it in the shop and, yeah. uh, you know, taking out the oily bits, I'd watch every one of those. That'd be amazing. A lot of people would. And it could be a how-to, Kyle, because yeah. a lot of people are interested in doing this. Right, and, yeah. you know, if you showed people how you did it on your vehicle, that might give people more confidence that they can convert their vehicle. So, yeah, that'd be I'm, an not awesome sure series. The, I'm not sure yeah. the exact vehicle would be a Ranger or a classic mini or a Defender or something like that, because I love Defender. British cars, but they're notoriously unreliable. And so, um, you know, would, would like to sort of fix some of that. Anyway, yeah. if anyone's interested watching from an industry standpoint that has something that could work for that, let me know. This is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Right. Um, but yeah, it would be cool to do it. Well, no one really does that anymore. Like Jack Rickard used to that, do that on EVTV and you could watch along every week and get a like, very in-depth, like they really get into the weeds of everything. And it's really great for, for people who want to do their own project, you know, it leaves out no surprises. You know, yeah. Exactly I would like to happen. cover more of these builds. I just don't know if they'll perform well or not. It's such an, right. a new world. So right. I'll tell you right now that the illuminator is not performing very well on our channel. And so if like the best one doesn't work that well, I'm not sure there's really a business case to build something else. Right. Uh, was it Stuart, uh, mentions that uh, this is a job for rich rebuilds, but even rich, you know, doesn't get into that the kind of details like that. You know, you, you if you watch his videos, you you can't just like go out to your garage and do it yourself. You're gonna there's gonna be a, a big learning curve if you end up trying going that path. But uh, but we should get back really to um, the Hyundai Ioniq Five Winter 70 mile an hour highway range test that <laughs> <laughs> that that Tom did. So we've talked about a lot about charging. So. And we and last week we had uh, Kyle had already did a 70 mile an hour range test, and but he started with outside temperatures around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and he got I think was it 227 miles on your charge? Yeah, so a little, little bit colder than that. It was low. It was like 51, but the average oh. of the test was probably 44, 45, and we ended up just about freezing. Um, yeah, definitely got colder as you know, we did it, you know, afternoon got dark, got cold. We live in the high desert. We don't retain much moisture in the ground to get the temperature swings are wild. And so, um, Tom did it in much colder temperatures on wider tires. We should talk about the tire selection oh, yes. for a second too, Tom, oh, because yeah. this is interesting. So, yeah. So, um, when I, when I started out, it was 20 degrees. When I ended, it was about 38 degrees. When Kyle started out, it was about 51, 52 and he ended probably about the same, right, Kyle in the thirties. Yeah. So, low, you yeah know, it, was like, it was like freezing. It was like 32 or 31 something. Yeah. My, it was warming up for me. It was cooling down for Kyle, but it was colder for me. And the car did sit out overnight. You know, it was, it was in my garage, but my garage still gets cold when it's, you know, down to 10 degrees overnight, the garage is like in the thirties. So, the car cold soaked in 30 degree temperatures overnight. And uh, I did take it to an Electrify America charging station and charged it up from about 50%. It wasn't the whole uh, full charge. Uh, and I uh, was quite disappointed, uh, quite honestly. Now I did have the, as Kyle mentioned, I had a limited, so it had the 20 inch uh, tire, uh, 20 inch wheels with the 255, 45 uh, R20 uh, Michelin tires. And it, it wasn't the Michelin just like I had the same model tires as you did, Kyle. It wasn't, um, I forgot what the precept, what are they called? The Michelin precept or something like that. Right, but um, it's different season. than the other limiteds. What's that? Yeah, it's you. well, different. that's what you said, that you you had driven a limited and it had the Michelin EV specific tires. When uh, I asked did, Hyundai about it, they were unaware that there was not an EV specific tire, this one individual mm -hmm. that you had on your car. They didn't know the car was on that tire basically. And okay. um, they basically said yeah, they're going to look into it. I haven't heard back, but it doesn't really matter that much. A lot of times OEs will spec two or three different tires for each wheel size that are approved in case there's manufacturing concerns or things like that. I do think, though, for you, they know you're doing range testing. They know, you know, I guess our numbers are small, but they're really meaningful. Um, I would think they would send you a car on the EV specific tire. Yeah. And, and well, it wasn't. And um, we finished up with 195 miles at 70 miles an hour, uh, you know, far short of, of the, the EPA's combined range rating of 256. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we, we try to find the EPA 
highway range rating, but this wasn't published. Uh, but still, it would have been much lower than than that in any event. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, we set the car up the same as Kyle did, goes in eco mode. We turn off winter mode so there's no battery preheating to, to t- sap some energy. Uh, I, I check the speedometer. Both, of the, both Kyle and I found that the speedometer was right on with the Ionic 5. That's not always the case. A lot of times we have to bump up our the cruise control to 71 or 72 miles an hour because the speedo's off. It's not in the Ionic. It's right on at 70 miles an hour. Um, there was very little wind. Uh, you know, tire pressure was set at manufacturer spec perfectly right on. Actually, they gave me the car with it perfect. I didn't have to really mess with it. Uh, and uh, you could see there, the uh, well, if you're watching on YouTube, I, I set up the four different quarters of the range test. And we drove 53 miles from 100 to 75 percent. 50 miles from 75 to 50, another 50 miles from 50 to 25, and then only 42 miles from 25% uh, down to zero. And uh, I pulled off the highway. It actually hit zero um, with about 40 miles driven and 193 miles uh, driven. And then as Kyle and I always do, you know, pull off the highway and we'll maybe drive at, at a lower speed, 40 or 50 miles an hour for a couple of miles until the battery just seems like it doesn't want to give you any more. Once you stop getting really any kind of pedal response when you when you push the accelerator, that's when I end the range test because it's, yep. you're getting close to just completely running out. And that was at 195 miles. Uh, pretty disappointing as far as I'm concerned. For the size of the battery, right? That's Yeah. 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 And it's a 77 kilowatt hour battery. You know, I, I really was expecting about 210. I knew I was going to get a little bit less than Kyle. Um, and, and, you know, you, it was cold. So to be fair to the vehicle, it, was, it wasn't going to get, you know, it was going to get 20 or 30 miles less, maybe, even, you know, than um, it would have been if it was warm out. But uh, I had in our, you know, when we do these range tests, we always want to start and end up at the same uh, charging station because we do these loop style tests. And the way I had it plotted out, I would have ended up at uh, the place I started at like 212 miles, something like that, which I was figuring we were going to do 215, but you know, as as once I got to about 70% state of charge, I mean, uh, 20% state of charge, I said, okay, I'm not going to make it. So now I'm going to pull out the app and and look for. And there are a couple of Electrify America stations that I can stop off at, and there was one which was you know about 15 miles short of of the original one I planned on. So that's where I ended it up. Um, I couldn't even make the, uh, the 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 station I planned on stopping at. And, you know, it's cold out. The tires make a big difference. A lot of the followers also even mentioned, well, Kyle, where Kyle is, the air's thinner, there's less resistance, you know, so that, you know, all these things add up. You know, everything took five miles off, five miles off, 10 miles off. And all of a sudden, you know, I end up with, you know, 30 miles less than what Kyle did. Uh, basically, you know, in um, the same I think time, it's pretty just reasonable. a little colder. And- to be expected. I think really the cold not only impact the, the cold affects EVs in two ways. You have to burn more energy to keep the cabin warm and the battery pack warm, but it yeah. also uh, lessens the available usable capacity out of the high voltage yeah. battery pack. Mm-hmm. So you can't actually get every last drop of juice out of it. Sometimes if you leave an EV at like 10% state of charge overnight and then it really warms up during the day, I'll notice my Tesla go like 12, 13, 14% more uh, because it's just gaining a bit of, of natural energy by being warm. And so, um, you know, temperature affects voltage levels at, at, at extremes. And so Hyundai might be protect, protecting us going into the bottom of the pack. It's possible these things will do 250, 260 miles in the warm weather on the good wheels not only just because it has less of a load, but also because there's more available energy in the battery pack. We do our best to counteract this by DC fast charging them up. But honestly, 100 miles into the trip, that's 100 miles of air, cold air blowing over your battery pack. Yeah, Yeah, it's got a lot of thermal mass. It's like a 1,200 pound battery, but that'll cool it down over 100 miles. And so the cold is, that's why we do cold tests. It's why we do warm tests. I wonder if running winter mode would get a better... Uh, result though because it would keep the battery warm you'd have to burn the energy but then the battery would be warm and there might be more usable capacity it might even out um but this is what i was considering when we did our range test at 227 at the end i was like yeah the last few percent we kind of just blew right through and i'm like i think the the car's freaking out a little bit here probably would have been actually better to have some heat in the battery pack and um well it is what it is yeah and i mean you look at my last quarter kyle Oh, sorry. I thought you were done talking. 
Um, you look at the last 25% and I only did 42 miles. The same thing happened to me. It really blew, like the percentage kept dropping much quicker as I got down to the end. And one thing I will note was because I had the limited, it has the, um, uh, the panoramic glass roof. Even though it was a cold day, it was a bright sunny day and that sun was beating into the cabin. So I didn't need to use much heat. I had it set on 68 like we always do, only fan setting one. And it really wasn't working hard to keep me nice and warm. As a matter of fact, the Ionic does tell you where all your percentage uh, of energy goes. And I only use 3% of energy for cabin heating, which is 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 Impressive. not a lot. You know, so um, I, I, I think that um, that really aided it. And it was 2% for um, electronics just to run the car. So I, I, I think I finished up with 95% of the energy we use was dedicated solely for propulsion. But as Kyle said, as the battery gets colder, there's just not as much usable energy there as it would be in the same pack if it was 20 or 30 degrees warmer. And I think we have almost proof of that in your numbers, Tom, because your efficiency didn't really change, but your miles driven from each percentage point did. And on that that would indicate that at least, uh, you know, either the battery capacity is, is lessening as the, the test goes on, or the BMS is just not equalizing those 25% chunks uh, from a customer visual standpoint, because some cars do massage the numbers for custom, mm -hmm. customer visuals. Uh, you know, we, we've seen Tesla do this too as well, where sometimes, you know, certain percentage ranges aren't actually equal to the rest. And a lot of this is BMS sway, and it's this car on this day, and how was it treated before you got it? And we're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty percents of, of this test, but yeah. it's always hard to have a perfect repeatable test. That's why we never say this is uh, replicatable. It's what we experienced in real time. Yeah. Um, Mark, could you pull that last graphic back up of the percentages? Uh, one thing I want to point out, if you notice in the first leg, I went the furthest 53 miles, but my efficiency was the worst. It kind of doesn't make sense. But when you think about it, that was because that's when I probably used the most energy to heat the cabin because as I was DC fast charging the car, it was sitting in the parking lot and the cabin was cold. So I hopped in the car to begin this test and the heater was probably working the hardest in the beginning. So I used the most energy to heat the cabin. Then once it got up to a nice temperature and the sun came out and it was shining in the cabin, the heater was using less energy. So that's why that those the efficiency and the miles driven don't drive, but it's because I believe at least it was because I used the most energy to warm the cabin in that first leg. Anyway, everyone's always curious, okay, how's the Ionic 5 versus X in this scenario? And we are going to answer that question for you in a couple of weeks. We're going to run Ionic 5 next to EV6, next to Mach-E, next to ID4 in a range test all at the same time, and we'll let you know. And I have one last thing that I know we need to move on, Dom, but no, talking about comparison videos... I have a friend who has a 2017 Chevy Bolt with, I think, like 70 or 80,000 miles, and he's getting the battery upgrade um, uh, uh, or yes. replacement, not upgrade, right, right. Um, you know, GM. So what I've been toying with, and uh, uh, what do you guys think about this if I should do this? I was thinking about doing a range test right before it goes in, and then he gets the new battery, and then we do it like two, two or three days later, so the temperature is kind of the same. And yes. doing a range test with that and seeing what the difference is. I'm I'm on the fence if that you think that'd be something that the, the followers would like to uh see. Well, I mean that's something really, I'd like to see. Yeah, yeah, it's cool, but it's yeah. not gonna help someone's buy. I know something. that's how I'm so, kind of like eh, well, I I'm kind of curious because I because I'm looking at you know, I'm looking at the bold if the if the price dropped down far enough, you know, because might be, there might be some hesitancy to buy them because they have had issues or whatever. So I'm thinking this and with the new but with the new batteries, I have you know a fair amount of confidence in them. But uh, I, I've seen some people report when they get their battery replacements that they the the showing like they have all this extra range, like way more than they've ever had before. But I think when they start driving, it goes back closer to normal. But it would I, I think it would be interesting to see, but I guess well, hey, Tom, leave your well, leave you your comments and let us know what you think. Here's how you do it. If you're going to be skipping a Hummer EV like range test, don't skip it for that. Oh, but yeah. if you got nothing else going on, let's see yeah. it. Yeah, I'm leaning towards maybe doing it. It's just two two days kind of back to back in in a in a 2017 Bolt driving them for four hours. You know, no lane uh, center. Let's <laughs> refresh. Well, that's the, yeah. Um, what one thing I want to put? Gary asked us: Are we going to be range testing the um, the smaller battery pack ionic five so kilowatt. one of the things about that gary is um the manufacturers as far as the press cars 
They never give us the small battery versions of the cars. They're not, they just don't put them in, in the, in their press pools. So for us to do that, we need to get one from an owner. So, Hey, if an owner offers Kyle or me, their vehicle with the smaller battery pack to do a range test and lets us charge it to hundred percent, drive it all the way down to zero, then we'd be happy to do it, but we'd need somebody to volunteer us that car. We're not going to get it from Hyundai. And that, that's only available the 58 kilowatt hour battery. That's only available in the lowest trim, mm -hmm. the base right. model. So I'm sure Ford we'll do it. Pretty but... good about putting base Mach E's in the fleet. I don't know. Maybe Hyundai will put one in there. I, <laughs> I don't think any have been in, been imported to the U S yet though. I don't think there are any here. Uh, before we move on, uh, Tom, did we do a winter, uh, a Tesla model Y uh, range test? Cause I'd be curious to see how that compared to the Hyundai. Cause they got similar size batteries, you know, very yeah. close, right? I haven't, and I do have one that I could do. I have a friend that's been offering me his Model Y 2021 to do range test. Um, so maybe I'll do that before it gets warm here. I mean, that's one of the most popular electric vehicles in the world now, so it makes a good benchmark, I think. Yeah. I did yeah. a warm weather one when they first came out. Right. I think I had 278 or something like that. Right, so 270, yeah. yeah. And I know Kyle's 270s. Yeah. done them also. Yeah. All right. So let's move on from Hyundai to another Hyundai, the uh, 2023 Kia Sportage uh, plug-in electric vehicle. Oh, I played has around arrived. with it yesterday. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, awesome. I'm at the so, Chicago Auto Show. Everything's yeah, here. So Kyle's in, like at the Chicago Auto Show, and if you want to see what that looks like, he has a video up yesterday morning of uh, him like taking you through a whole tour of the of the show floor, of the show floor. <laughs> and... Uh, it's yeah. really long. It's, it's not all electric. There's still, you know, plenty of uh, internal combustion out there, but there's some electric stuff out there. You got to see the it's Ford like Transit. Less than 10% electric. Right. Yeah. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. It's probably honestly 3% electric if you add up the cars or less. Right. But and, and, you know, me, I'm, a, I'm a combustion enthusiast, so I'm happy right. there. That's why I'm not recommending you all watch this video. But we right. do I mean, geek out about some EVs. There's a Silverado EV I got to see for the first time. All oh, right, yeah, true. Are you make, you're making a video of that. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna shoot it literally right after this. Okay, because we yeah we want to see how that folds down in, in the back. I uh, got to play around with it. It's awesome. It is so freaking cool. The Silverado okay. EV was not on my radar at all, and then they pull this thing in in RST trim on. 24 inch wheels, huge whoa. wheels. They're like the size of a small planet, and it's like whoa. And it looks so much better than Hummer EV. And it's got way more cool stuff inside, I think. And it was blue. I think they just like had it presented properly. But it wasn't like right up front in the GM booth. If they have their new Z06 right up front, then you got to walk past the Equinoxes, past the Tahoes, past the Chevy Trax. You go past their charging station, which is your phone charging station, not a real charging station. And then you get to the Silverado EV all the way in the back. Right. Well, Chicago is a weird show because it's not necessarily like the cutting edge. It used to be more of the like the trucks and like industrial kind of things. But it's, it's kind of changed a bit now. But it's not like at the, like L.A. where they put, you know, all their future, the best Honestly, kind of CES stuff. CES is the best auto show of the year now, which is okay. a tech show <laughs> right. because there's most EVs. Anyway, Silverado EV is the jam. I'm so into it. I see why people are into it. Um, we got to play around with F-150 Lightning and Silverado EV. Oh, nice. And, uh, you know, of course, Ionic, EV6 were here, uh, Mach-E's, everything was blast. Really good time. All right. All right. So our, our top story is the Kia Sportage uh, plug-in electric hybrid. Did you say Sportage or did you say Sportage? Sportage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's like saying Target instead of Target. Rodeo. Um, <laughs> this is, so the Sportage is Kia's longest running uh, model, and this is the first time they've offered it, I believe, as a plug-in hybrid. It goes on sale in the third quarter of this year. So the big number here is, uh, well, modest number is 32, and that's how many miles of electric range it's rated for. It uses a 13.8 kilowatt hour pack to achieve that, and it's got like a 1.6 liter turbocharged four-cylinder with 177 horsepower and 195 pound-feet of torque. Uh, in this case, it's it's paired up with a 90 horsepower electric motor, 66.9 uh, kilowatts. Uh, that's the same setup it appears as they use in the Sorento, which is a little which is larger. And in that car, it puts out uh, 265 horsepower, like all together. Um, yeah, with 258 pound-feet of torque, so it, it should be plenty nippy. 
And I don't really have a whole lot of information about this because it was super late when I was putting this show together last night. And I don't know, I'm still trying to decide how much we want to, you know, focus on like plug-in electric hybrids. How how relevant are do you guys think that the plug-in hybrids are now? And what, what do you think relevant. about this car? They're so annoying is what okay. they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I don't need to, I can have an hour long video and I will have an hour long video on why I think plug-in hybrids are great for some people and really not great for others. Uh, but I got to play around with this. looks nice. It's basically the same thing as the Tucson plug-in hybrid, I think, is the competitor underneath. Um, yeah, it's to be expected. Um, looks really good in person. You can get really nice chunky tires for it and everything. Uh, you know, it should allow a lot of electric driving and we'll play around with it. We'll be getting it soon. All right. Oh. So yeah, Dom, let me chime in real quick. I agree with Kyle as far as I'm not an enthusiast for plug-in hybrids, but yeah, we do need to cover them because a lot of people are, and a lot of people um, will not go full EV yet. Right. So we need to talk about um, the benefits and the disadvantages of plug-in hybrids. So right. I'm actually getting the um, Sorento plug-in hybrid in a couple of weeks Good for a week loan. And I'm going to do um, some, uh, you know, some videos on that. Kyle's already uh, driven it, and um, but I haven't yet. And uh, we'll talk about the benefits and the disadvantages of going plug-in hybrid. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I really try to steer people away from them, to be honest with you. But uh, the fact of the matter is, a lot of people just are not ready and will not buy um, uh, a, a a fully electric car yet. And these are EVs with training wheels, and they get people used to plugging in, and it gets people comfortable. With right. plugging in, uh, so I'm I'm all for the manufacturers continuing to make them until they have a complete portfolio of affordable fully electric vehicles. We should right. debate this someday because I think it gives you the worst impression of an EV. Okay, because uh, it's kind of interesting, and, though, like the, the original... And if we do that, if we do that, we need to bring. Sorry, Dom. We need to bring on plug-in hybrid owners and see what they're how they feel about the vehicle. Do they say, ah? Like, this is terrible. I'll never get an EV now after owning this POS. Or do they say, I love plugging in. I, you know, I, 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 you know, most of I my driving is on electric. So, yeah, I mean, hate them because I know yeah. both on either side. Yeah. Right. So, well, well, would, what would be great is to have somebody on both sides of that. And we could, you know, talk to the actual owners too, because we're tainted. You know, our opinions are tainted. We've driven so many really good fully electric cars. We've lived with them for years. It's easy, I think, for us to say, ah, like, like, why would you waste your time with that? You know, but, the, the, you know, you, you do talk to people that, you know, I've talked to so many people that really want an electric vehicle, but they're just, they can't pull the trigger. They're not ready to pull the trigger. Right. And then they've gotten like the BMW plug-in hybrids, for instance. And, um, and then they're like, yeah, after living with it for six months, they're like, yeah, I should have went full electric. This is great, and uh, for that purpose, I think they're that we they shouldn't go extinct just yet. But I soon. just had the the new Ford Escape plug-in hybrid for as plug as far as plug-in hybrids go, it was great. But then it's it's great on one hand. It did thirty nine miles in the city, by the way, on one okay. charge. That's awesome. That's Rav Four Prime numbers almost right there. Um, I, look, this is this is a long topic to debate. I'm not yeah. personally against plug-in hybrids. It's a good use case for me. I drove that Escape for a week. I think I used gas like one time, and so like, but then why did I haul around that giant combustion engine and get 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour when I could have gotten something way more efficient with way more range that I didn't even need? So this yeah. is this is the topic I think it struggles with. And right. Boston Dan's 100 right. I've owned both fully electric all the way. You're right. If you've owned both. The answer will be fully electric all the way, but your three percent of the population, that ninety-seven percent of the population, uh, many of those people are, will not go full electric just yet. They're just not ready for it. It's easy for us, and especially a lot of our fans, to talk about how it's you know there's no decision. Just buy an EV, um, unless you have a use case like Kyle explains, where you you know you live in the Midwest, you drive five hundred miles every week, you know to tow stuff and everything, and it might not work for you, but um, the fact of the matter is we, we can't live in this vacuum um, that we sometimes see, only see that, you know, of course, electric vehicles work because we own them and we live with them. We, we need to get mainstream people that uh, have never even considered an EV 
to plug in and sometimes the plug-in hybrids work for that purpose right so but yeah maybe we will do a, a debate one, one I show love that Brandon's one. comment down here yeah. because it's so accurate it gives you not range anxiety but gas anxiety because you right. plug it in everywhere i keep knocking this dang light you plug it in everywhere <laughs> and and you try not to have the combustion engine kick on yeah. Right. Hey, so that points that uh, it, it is still a good you know option for some people. Jacob Marley uh, mentioned earlier that 32 miles of battery only operation allows 98 percent of his driving to be EV, but it also allows him to visit his family in West Virginia, where there isn't a whole lot of fast charging unless you have a Tesla. I think there's a fair amount of Tesla chargers there now, but uh, yeah, right, there's still, there's still some infrastructure that needs to be put into uh, West Virginia. Um, yeah, but and it's also interesting that the you know the the OG of plug-in electric vehicles GM doesn't make one anymore. They've gone all they've left that behind. They're all electric now, and it's just like the other brands like Kia, and uh, we also saw the 2023 Alfa Romeo Tonale plug-in hybrid uh, you know debut this week, and that's I mean that's an interesting that's going to be coming to the to the US in about a year from now, mm -hmm. and it's got a you could, you could get it with a regular, like a 1.3 liter multi-air turbocharged four cylinder gas engine. Um, no, it's no, that's the, that's the, uh, plug-in hybrid motor actually. Sorry. So the, the, just the combustion version is a two liter turbo four and it's like 256 horsepower, uh, and they're, they're all, all wheel drive. The, uh, the plug-in electric hybrid version of that has the 1.3 liter multi-air turbocharged four-cylinder with a high-voltage belt starter generator, which I'm not sure what that does, a six-speed automatic transmission, and a 90 kilowatt or 121 horsepower electric motor on the rear axle. And that makes 272 horsepower. So the spicy one might be the plug-in hybrid, actually, in, in that case. I, I don't Such know. Such an uninspiring design, if you ask me. I, I, like yeah, the, I think it looks end. great, really. I, li I like the front end, but that is it. The rest of it, cut off that front end and tell me what vehicle that is. What is it, a Ford Escape or something? Like, I, I, To me, that is just, they got lazy, uh, you know, or they just decided to make, um, you know, Aero the primary focus. And, you know, I just, to me, that's not, Alphas are supposed to really, have distinctive styling. And I think that is just cookie cutter black. They have a very sporty heritage for sure, right? Italian. I think yeah, it looks not... great. I just am very disappointed with the drivetrain options. This should have the Maserati MC20's twin turbocharged V6 inside to give it a real spicy thing, but we're an EV podcast. So, I mean, if that's, that's an option, you know, they have, they're going to have a gas option and plug in an electric hybrid option. They I'm not sure why their, their gas option, it, it looks, train. their gas option just doesn't, you know, this is like the size of a BMW X1, I, yeah, I understand, right? Yeah, and their two liter is so crunchy and not great. It makes a lot of torque, but it hates to rev. It's not an inspiring engine. It shouldn't be installed inside of an Alpha, in my opinion. And um, there's so many better engines they can pull from their, their parts bin to put in this thing. Right. Uh, yeah. Stewie, Stewie Thomas says, it looks like Martin's MG. <laughs> yeah, and then the next comments, the best, Martin sitting in the timeout chair. Okay, Martin, oh, please chime in true. on yes. this vehicle because we want to make sure you're alive. I've been enjoying putting the pictures up and the captions. And, um, I'm not I saying you're not working. It's hey. just you haven't heard you. <laughs> well, hey, this isn't. This definitely isn't work. Uh, but um, I was surprised. I read the press release, and as I was reading it, they talked a lot about hybrid technology. And as Dom says, um, a, you know, uh, the electric starter motor generator, and they were uh, all about how hybrid technology can help reduce your miles per gallon. And oh. that is kind of a uh, language and, and a, a philosophy that probably worked 10 years ago, was a bit long in the tooth five years ago. And now it really is a last resort if you're not going to make a full EV. But to try and, you know, if I did a word search, electrified would probably have been the most commonly used word because like electrified is the thing that they've got to fall back on because it sounds like it's electric but it, electrified gets them out of out of the hole so yeah i mean i think disappointing for alpha and there's a lot of stuff that should be on this car in terms of a full electric powertrain they're like they're a big enough company and they've got enough uh, across their brands to pull in from um and, and as i'm always saying on my podcast you know we are really spoiled here in europe in terms of we've got you know i've been talking about the the e-transit for instance uh and and that is, that's really it for you guys there's the bright drop vans but you've just you know delivered to customers yesterday or this week is the transit whereas over here we've got all the 
Citroën and the Peugeots, and there's even a Toyota rebadged version of those. And we've got a ton of commercial vehicles. So they've got enough in, Mercedes in, their, in their locker to do something interesting uh, with all of their brands, let alone uh, this, which just comes with a plug-in. But yeah, I think kind of disappointing, but they know, they know their customers better than I do. So it, it, it wouldn't be for me. It's exactly, I agree with you guys exactly. My head understands plug-in hybrids. My heart would never own one just because I've lived, I've lived EV. But I understand intellectually the, the decision-making process that our viewers who own hybrids go through. Like, I need the engine, I want the electric, but it wouldn't be for me just because I'm just because I'm done with servicing oily bits, uh, unless it's something kind of interesting, like I don't know, like a classic car in the garage or something. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm on this car. Right. Ah, so like I said, I didn't do a lot of prep last night for the show, so that's well, we're basically already an all... hour and ten minutes in, and I got a giant <laughs> auto show behind me. I got to cover. Right, but I did want to mention uh, if you haven't watched um, if you haven't watched. Uh, Martin's show yesterday, oh, no. he, he, and I did want to put this in the show notes, but I just didn't get to it. That the uh, so the White House rolls out a five billion funding plan. That's out of a seven point five billion thing altogether, or seven point three billion. The rest of that money is going to be allocated this summer. But um, they just rolled out that five billion of that is going to be given to the states recently. And during that presentation, Biden did something that he hasn't done before and see if i can do this properly now there you go sorry no. i put it still up but you might have the video handy i, I do have the video handy oh, there you go you do it you do it that and oh. this. from iconic oh. companies like gm and ford building out a new electric vehicle production to tesla our nation's largest electric vehicle manufacturer <laughs> <laughs> he did it. Oh, well. It's all over. <laughs> Podcast 1300. Well, and, hey, uh, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid I, of it. I, I, uh, he did it. Like, that's it. Fantastic. Uh, we, we, we sing from the heavens. Biden said the T word. Can we all now please move on? Um, although one of our mutual friends, Pete Bremy, did email me to say, no, this is, I'm really serious about this because I want the, our president to recognize the number one EV maker. Um, cause I've kind of not belittled it, but just said, look, come on, it's ridiculous. Elon Musk doing silly tweets, doesn't build bridges. Um, as an observer of American politics, I was always told your president is always about, he's one of those guys that reaches across the aisle and builds bridges. Like the fact that he wouldn't say Tesla for union reasons or what personal reasons, like, I don't like what Elon Musk tweets half the time. Some of the things that he's tweeted over the years about certain people and the cave issue like i don't find that what like his humor but, but if you're a politician you got to get past all that like yeah i appreciate what he does as a businessman and the businesses he builds i don't particularly like some of the stuff he tweets but you can't just not mention tesla out of those personal reasons if right. if, if if biden felt the same as i do but particularly not because he's meant to be building bridges um, and yeah, their politics are entirely different. Like, do you remember when Elon Musk was an advisor to Donald Trump? That lasted like three seconds. But that, but I do get the feeling that Musk's politics are probably very different to Biden's. But right. you can't not mention Tesla for that reason, or because it's not unionized or whatever. So not when it's done so much, you know, for well, the electrification of transport, which is like their goal to reduce carbon. And you know, that's Tesla's really set the tone and the pace and. Their it's goal is to standard. make money, Dominic. It's not to do anything like that. It is I mean, to that's, sell that's, cars. So what, what, for whatever reason, you and you haven't got to be his best friend, and you certainly haven't got to endorse the company like he's endorsing Ford and he's endorsing General Motors and he's having a big love-in with Mary Barrett, etc. And I get all the reasons why with unionized labor. And as listeners of my podcast and viewers know, that's probably where politically I lean. Like, I like collective bargaining for the workers. Like, I like workers to be able to get together and for the little man to fight against the big man. That's kind of where I am politically. But it's fine if you don't agree with me. We'll still be friends. And so, but for Biden not to be, or, or even anyone who speaks like uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg, for him not to be coming out and, and praising Tesla for the things they do well. Now, equally in his role, if Tesla start to come under more pressure for their autonomy suite, and there has to be some intervention there from government agencies to 
and, and you know, there's been three Tesla recalls this week, whether you agree they should or not be called a recall, they are. So yeah, again, I know show. you have to, tr- yeah, you have to tread carefully if you're a politician. I get it. You can't be someone's best friend because it, you know, lands you in it if they then misbehave. But at least recognize the work that, as we found out this week in the 10K filing on Monday, Tesla has a hundred thousand employees. I don't know how many are in Germany or China, but say like I don't know, seventy five thousand in the US. Like that's a lot of American citizens right. who are doing an amazing job at Tesla. And so it was ridiculous that he wouldn't do it. I'm so pleased it's all over. Right. It, well, it may be, maybe he'll never say that word again, but fantastic that he did. So b- before we end, I, I did want to mention there's a few stories I just want to just mention briefly. Uh, so the, and you can find these on uh, Inside EVs, the 2022 Volkswagen ID4 is coming uh, with a few changes this year, uh, next year. So uh, DC fast charging is going to be improved somewhat. It's going to, going to peak at 135 kilowatts instead of 125 i'm not sure about how that will change the overall time time uh, charging time um it'll have an auto feature auto hold feature a plug and charge feature which i don't know why it's taking this long but it's coming at least and that, that'll make it that makes the uh, charging experience um, a lot more seamless you just plug it in it charges it bills you and it, you know it's like a tesla it, easy easy peasy and also, if you find a charging station that supports plug and charge, I'm sorry, I had to interrupt that. Uh, no, that's, <laughs> that's, good, that's good. And we should mention that to uh, all the different uh, uh, infrastructure companies that we speak with. It will be on our weeks. discussions for sure. Yeah, get that friction out of the process. Um, and it also gets a small uh, undisclosed range increase. So that's something. Um, I don't know. I think anyone wanted to mention anything about that. I think okay, moving also, on real quick. I, I think oh. it also allows for the vehicle to load or vehicle to grid VW charger when it arrives on the scene, which should be imminent, I gather. So okay. uh, that allows uh, CCS, uh, the, the same as, as as the other ones that aren't Chadamo, um, for you, to be a backup for your house. Okay. We should point out, though, that Volkswagen did promise plug-in charge before the end of 2021. They didn't fulfill that promise. Right. Okay. Um, moving on. Uh, Ram Revolution electric pickup has been teased. Uh, that's, that's the last name of the, the new electric pickup that Ram, excuse me, which is part of Stellantis. And they gave a little silhouette so you can kind of get an idea of what's coming. And, you know, there's not a lot there, but I think it's worth at least mentioning that because we've seen like the Ford uh, F-150 Lightning coming and the Silverado EV and the Sierra the GMC Sierra EV is coming, and of course the GMC Hummer, which is a little less pickup trucky, I think, in, in the traditional sense. But you know, Ram is getting there eventually, and it's going to be called the Revolution, which is, I think, I don't know, decent name. Kyle, it doesn't, it doesn't scare. But I think, and I gotcha. Uh, all it's right. not la- it, I don't know. Name confirmed. Whoa. Right, right. It's not, but it, at least we know that it's on the revolution. way. Revolution. Why is everything a revolution with electric? It's just the way it should have been. Right. It's oh. going uh, Ram the way it should have been. And and speaking Although of, I do uh, love a Hemi V8. Don't get me wrong. Give me a TRX. I'll be happy any day of the week. So uh, speaking of, uh, Martin was talking about electric vans earlier. So Ford has started shipping its 2022 e-transit vans to U.S. customers. I believe you saw that there in Chicago, Kyle. Uh, yep, seen it many times. Love everything about it. I can't wait to drive it. They held this little event of small journalists that cover like industry stuff to go and drive it. I was so jealous. Everyone can be out driving whatever new hot McLaren 720S. I hit the light again that they're doing. People go and drive the e transit. Ah, I just really wanted to drive that so bad. Right. So, uh, talking I, about the e transit before we get off of that thumb. So, you know, we, we talked about the U.S. Post Office wanting to convert to electric. And, oh you know, the previous um, uh, the Postmaster General was going to buy like 70 percent ICE vehicles. And now they're talking about maybe revamping that. OK, we have one. What, why can't the, the, the e-transit be reconfigured to be the mail truck? You know, I th- that was some of the issue early on was that one of the complaints was, well, we don't really have one that would work perfectly in a company that can scale up to build it. OK. We have one now, and it's in production. Use that. Uh, that that postal 
vehicle is almost like a whole show. I think they really should just scrap it and go start again from the bottom up. Yeah, and that thing make... was so freaking ugly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, what, and I don't have a whole lot. You know, maybe Oshkosh makes good whatever they make. They've you know been yes, in business for a long time. Giant military trucks that are yeah. awesome. Right. Yeah. I don't but, have you know huge amount of confidence they can do as good a job as you know someone who's making making electric vehicles for, yeah. for you know a decade or something. So Green transit would be perfect. Right. I mean, well, I th I think they'd have to, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think really oh, it needs yeah. to be from the like wheels up uh, vehicle, you know, specifically. I mean, it, could, it could do a lot of, you know, because the, the USPS does use like minivans from uh, from Stellantis or Chrysler or whatever already now or from different manufacturers. But like the standard little truck that you see coming up every every day on your house. Yeah, we got like lifted four wheel drive stuff for some of our rural mountain deliveries. It's pretty sweet. Right on. Uh, all right. So, and just moving on, I guess before we end, I just also wanted to say that the VW ID Buzz is going to make its first public appearance in Austin on March 11th. South Austin. by Southwest. Austin. Yep. At South by Southwest. Yes. But that's, that's just it. a weird place. It's almost like, I don't know, what else is in Austin, Texas <clears> now? Uh, Tesla headquarters and Giga Factory. I don't now. think it has anything to do with that. Yeah, you think it's just yeah. like pure. I mean, it's a the cool head of, event. Head of South Volkswagen and, and Tesla and, and uh, Elon, they both they get along somewhat. They've been you know hung out together, driven each other's cars, I think, and yep. you know they have an amicable uh, relationship or have had. So it's kind of interesting that that the uh, event, the VW Buzz, is going to make its debut there. In, in I just want this to be brilliant, and I'm worried because the price is leaked. I don't mind how high the price is, because I wasn't going to buy one anyway. And EV buyers have a bit of price elasticity, so they'll do the stretch to get an EV. But the price is leaked this week out of two German publications, and it kind of matched from what they both said. Um, and they were giving prices for the 77 kilowatt hour version. And I'm like, please tell me there's one above it. There has to be one above it. That It can't come with the same battery as a yeah, big ID4. They put a big 100-something kilowatt hour. Yeah, well, the, the platform, the MEB platform can take 111. Yep. It was designed to take 111. So please, 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 I don't care what it costs, make it a halo vehicle because few few yep. people will buy it anyway. But that gets the headlines, then make a 40 grand version. We can all drive. Yep. But, oh, please don't make this like 150 mile. It'll be a laughing stock. And I want to love this so much. I think I think they know what they're doing. And I think yeah. I think it's going to be expensive. And I think it's going to be super rad i can't wait for it <laughs> Did you say you saw some price leaks uh, martin yeah two price leaks uh and they were both kind of the same it was two two german publications went with the pricing this week uh which was seventy thousand euros Whoa. of course we include vat That's i right. think germany is still 20 percent vat yeah. uh so and that is if i get my calculator out here and so seventy thousand euros is going to be for our u.s audience uh, that converts to eighty thousand US dollars, but of course taxes and yeah. things. But often, as. often you, you can almost do like a one for one exchange in yeah. a way because they sell vehicles in the US a lot cheaper. I don't know if it's because of the the volume, so they last sell cheaper or what it is. But often the price in pounds or, or euros will be very close to what we have here. So I'm thinking this will be close to like a Tesla Model Y. Uh, range like no, it's gonna be more thousand. expensive. I think this yeah, thing could be a hundred grand, and they'll sell every single one of, of them course. without question. Yeah, it launches so as a make five it nice. Yeah, yep. Make it right. expensive, make it nice, and make it a halo car. Don't try and get this in the hands of the masses. They'll work their way down there. And exactly. You can come out so, with versions later. Right. Starts with a, starts with a five seat version, then comes later this year with a three seat, uh, seven seater. And I really hope that Marvin has inside information. Firstly, he spelled my name correctly, so I love Marvin already. We can be best friends. What a um, guy! Uh, I, I I hope he has information that I don't because okay. so maybe it's cheaper uh, than that. Let's hope it's cheap. It, it, I mean, the articles also said base price forty, um, starting at forty for like the kind of commercially no frills fabric seats version. But hey, I don't care about that. Oh, I don't care about that. We I want there to time. be. A... <laughs> uh, it's time to stop. I think we've all got giddy. Yes. All right. All right, so that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. That helps us out a lot if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. You can follow Tom Malogny at Tomalog. That's with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. 
watch the show every day. Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week or maybe even sooner. Okay. Ciao.